Shalom Ovracha Ov. As always, it's always a pleasure to schmooze with you. How are you doing today, Ov? Um, yes, better after um, our little schmooze talk beforehand. You know, um, it, um, I feel much better. Absolutely. So, Ov, what do you what do you think about my? What do you think about the time is now to expand 770? What do you think about that poster? Yeah, actually, you know, I, this one in my heart uh, is currently with Jerusalem and with my brethren on Mount Zion and uh, with you guys, you know, we're going through an extremely difficult time. And um, it was, um, you know, the story on the expansion of, of 7070, you know, hit on the... Um, the only 11, I think, on the 11th or something like this, you know. So, anyway, um, I thought it was quite some distraction, you know. Uh, it was uh, the day when the Epstein client list came out, and immediately, uh, 7070 came out, conspiracy theories went wild. Like, I, I mean, I've never seen so much bullshit, sorry, excuse my French, uh, then over the last days concerning the expansion of when you came out and said that you started the expansion, the 7070 uh, expansion product 10 years ago. And uh, so I, I found this extremely funny, extremely funny and uh, uh, sort of a providence. You know, that we can, we too can solve now the big mysteries and conspiracies, you know, about Crown Heights and what's happening there and what's with the rebel and why it's good that you expand the work of the rebel. So I am um, absolutely keen on listening to what you have to say about your expansion project. Okay, thank you. All. So first of all, here, here next, uh, on the background, it says Umisham. This is a Sikha of the Rebbe. So this is a one of the Rebbe's speeches that was recorded. The Rebbe looked at it when they printed it, made sure that it's all good, and said it's ready for publishing. So the Rebbe, it says, I, I highlighted a piece. The, of course, this design I made was 10 years ago. Um, and I highlighted the piece and it says, and from there it will return to Jerusalem. We understand the greatness and the merit of every single one in Israel to be part of with his body with his money and the more is the better when it comes to building the house of rabbeinu in bavel base rabbeinu ship in bavel as a preparation for the coming down and the revelation of the future temple take it from miad mamish so as a chassid that of course when the rebbe says something this is a, a you know this is enough for me you know if the rebbe says this is good so when the rebbe says that it's everyone should be involved physically and with their money to expand the synagogue so as students that was enough for us you know now they say that it's a tunnel but it's not really a tunnel there's different sections underneath 770 so um the section uh right next to the wall that they broke that is the Gniza basement. That's a basement that they put all the, the holy books that need to be buried. Okay, so buried. Yes. Let's say the book is ripped or it, it doesn't it, you can't use it anymore in the synagogue, in the shul. So they have to bury it like a Jewish burial in the ground. And then the next basement has the menorah of 770. It's a very big menorah, um, similar to the type of menorah in the temple it has the rebbe's chair it has special um tables and and stuff that they use and then the next basement is the mikvah which is the um bath for you know the holy uh, for for, 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 for yeah, purification for ritual bath, for ritual rit bath. Yeah, ritual bath. Yeah. so so really it's quite amazing the the infrastructure under 770 it's very, very similar to what you would expect in the in the Holy Temple, really, if you think about it. Now, what the students did was they dug a hole in the wall from the mikveh to the basement of the um, 
menorah and all this. And they kept going all the way till they got to 770. Now, the idea is that the Rebbe already agreed that all this area, it's not like they were violating, you know, anything. It's already agreed by the Hasidim and by the hey, Rebbe. Of that, course. Of that course. All this I mean, expanded. this, no, okay, I'm saying uh, the Rebbe also planned it. The Rebbe agreed to the plans, the blueprints as well. Yeah, but um, okay. So from a from a world trade perspective, because I read, you know, your article, you had uh, you published an article on MN Global, yeah. and um, actually said that one of the first issues was that it's um, you know very was very sad that the uh, New York Police Department came in, you know, and that basically holy matters were treated by the goy by the police. Police of the Goy. Now, New York City, over the last years, has been, um, <clears throat> you know, on the very, very downhill. Um, a persecution of Donald Trump. Uh, the founding of the Federal Reserve 110 years ago. So it had just a birthday. And um, in a way, you had Chris Cuomo, who reigned supreme during the lockdown as a little dictator you know, violating anybody's right, including the uh, our religious rights of freedom, you know, to come to Jerusalem, to live free and so on, be, stay unvaccinated as a holy people, as a holy seed of Israel, to stay unvaccinated, to reject the um, whatever, you know, the poison death shock from Dr. Frank Zelenko, you know, great job. So... Yeah. When I heard about the first time the story, I've, I, the first thing I thought, oh my gosh, these are teenagers who give a fuck about the, uh, what the city says about the rules. We do what's fun. So I, I mean, I personally, uh, you know, lived in several houses in Israel where because of the construction permits, you never get... So everybody has a, 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 an additional cellar, you know, there, and the, the deeper you dig and the farther you go, well, the more space you have. So I thought it's the coolest thing. So as a teenager, growing up in 7070 in Crown Heights, where the whole road, they're all Hasidim, everybody knows each other, so that they come up with a project like this, I think it's pretty normal. You know, so no, nothing conspiratorial, nothing uh, out of usual. No, there were some kids, you know, who took the words of the rebel serious, not like some other schmucks. No, in full enthusiastic um, expectation of the coming of the Moshiach, and they started digging. Why not? So if I would grow up in 7070, I would dig too, more, most likely, to, to say that. I, I thought it was pretty cool. You know, right. and, so and Wolf, I, I will I want to add that um, you know, some of the guys said, Oh, they have mattresses there and this and this and that. So I actually spoke to uh some of my friends that are of course there, and uh yeah. they told me that hey Yossi, uh the mattresses were being held up because um first of all, there was no pillows and blankets. If somebody was actually sleeping there, they wouldn't just find mattresses. The mattresses are there because during the Tishrei months, many, many um, guests come from all over. So this is like a storage place. So they store mattresses and the mattresses were being held up by the students because they didn't want the cameras to film the students in order that they shouldn't get in trouble. Um, so that's just that's just a small detail that I know from the guys that were there now. Um, there's a few other issues. Number one, people have to understand that um, the Gabayim right now, unfortunately, so there's the Maskirus, which is the Rebbe's office. Now, after the Rebbe's passing, Yudha, Yudha, uh, Yudha, Yudha, Yudha Krinsky so took over the, the 770. Yeah. Huh? You're using now a language which is very familiar to Hasidim. But for those, when we're going out now on YouTube and all the other channels, and uh, we explain this to, um, you know, guys, I think uh, you should get an introduction of the inner works of, uh, of, uh, of the synagogue. You know, how does, okay. you know, 
uh, and then of course how the ranks is in the synagogue and what's with the Beit Din and how this is all connected. Could you perhaps give there a little chukchik overview? Okay, so so the of course the Rebbe is the Nasi Hadar. The Rebbe is the leader of the shul. That's number one. Now the Rebbe has an office in the Rebbe's office. People like uh, our advisor, Dr. Trapler, um, uh, Yudel Krinsky, and other people work in the office in different capacities, like a secretary, a label groaner, you know, different drivers. Yudel Krinsky was the Rebbe's driver. Label groaner was the Rebbe's bodyguard. I don't know, but likes to push people around. You have different people that worked in the office, okay? So uh, and the, each one had a different role. You had... Um, you know, the, the, the real hardcore Hasidim that they can hold a secret, they, they were the ones who, they would pick up the phone when the prime minister would call or the presidents of different countries would want to talk to the Rebbe. They would be the ones who uh, would make sure that the Rebbe knows that this president or this prime minister wants to talk to them. So you had different people in the Rebbe's office that had different roles. Once, um, we didn't see the Rebbe anymore, you know, according to our eyes, you know. When Mashiach comes, we'll see, we'll, we'll find out what that was about. But once we don't see the Rebbe, um, a lot of 770 goes up for grabs. Just like when the, the communism fell, you know, uh, a lot of different people started grabbing different pieces of the industry, you know. So... Yudel Krinsky was able to convince um, the New York courts in the United States that he is the one that the Rebbe intended that should have the, the deeds of 770, the Rebbe's house, and so on. Now, there was an argument about uh, the Rebbe's tzava, the Rebbe's will. So the Hasidim knows that the, the Rebbe in Tavshin Memches, uh, 1980. Eight or I think the Rebbe already wrote a will in, but it's uh, in Judaism. If you write a will, it's a merit for long life. So everyone knew the Rebbe's will, but Yudel produced a new will, and he said this was the real will. And somehow, for you know, by great coincidence, he's the one who gets the Rebbe's house on seven seventy. So the Hasidim weren't sure if Yudel was honest, if he wasn't honest. Yudel wasn't trying to convince anybody in Chabad. Uh, he was just trying to convince the people that actually it matters, like the people in the courts. And once he convinced them somehow, he got the rights to 770. Now, uh, it still doesn't mean that whatever he says goes, because the Rebbe made it very clear that 770, the library of the books that they have from the Baal Shem Tov, and, and so on. Everything that's connected to the property of the Rebbe belongs to the Hasidim. Okay, this was an established fact. So, who's in charge of what the Hasidim want? The Gabayim. The Gabayim are the group of rabbis that actually run 770. Okay, they're the ones who, if you have a bar mitzvah, if you have a, if you're a Chatan, you're getting married next week, you want to go up to the Torah. So they're the ones who actually run the shul. And the Gabayim were more on the side of, you know, the, the typical Hasidim. And they didn't really like Mr. Krinsky very much either. Now, <clears throat> the situation turned out that as everybody found their place, the Gabayim and Krinsky started to go to war because Krinsky wanted to control 770 more, and the Gabayim wanted to control 770 more, and they started throwing millions and millions of dollars for lawyers, and just throwing, basically flushing good money down in the drain with the with the, with the the court systems of doom, you know, that and now the non-Jews, the lawyers, the judges, they don't care, it's Jews fighting. They're not here to try to resolve the issue, as long as they're fighting, they, they, you know, the court doesn't buy. And unfortunately, so unfortunately, you know, um, I can confirm this. You know, this is the secular court system. So, of course, in Germany, it's not uh, necessarily the Jewish communities fighting, but the Christian communities. 
And as long like religious people fight in front of a secular court uh, system, the, I mean, the seculars are the winners in our case, and the religious guys are always the losers. In the moment they go in front of a worldly court, they're all the losers, all of them. You know, and 100%. it's uh, it's very sad, you know, that the the institutionalization of religion or religious groups or so. I mean, this is um, it's never good. It's never good, I think. A hundred percent. So, it's, uh, funny as well so now people. when the Gaboim, when the Gaboim discover that for the past 10 years, there has been a underground operation and and you can imagine how secretly these guys are doing it that for 10 years straight, uh, during the corona, by the way, the Gaboim was, of course, following the, the, the law, and they shut down 770. And the, and the students were not having it. So the students were basically saying, um, we want to study in 770. So if we want to study in 770, then why should... Um, why should the 770 be shut down because of the corona? It's BS. You know, uh, so now all these students have all this time on their hands. So if in the beginning it was only a small group of students that were actually ready to be part of this, of expanding 770, now the entire yeshiva was ready to volunteer. OK, so now in a bit, we're talking about hundreds of students, maybe thousands of students already you know, with a spoon and a, and a fork, ready to dig in the, and get going. <laughs> so, so uh, of course, this uh, this uh, may have expedited the operation. You know, now at the end of the day, um, there's multiple different um, versions of what's happening, and I'm now in Israel. So honestly, even though I started this, I I honestly don't know exactly what's going on. Um, so I really don't have any proof in any direction. But the bottom line is, is that the Gaboim, when they see 770 expanding, they don't see this as, oh, finally, the Rebbe's wishes are coming true. Let's see if we can get a permit and let's finish the job. The guy's already started. No, they say, we're busy fighting in court. Dealing with expanding the building is going to take away energy and resources from us fighting in court. So we should just dump a bunch of cement and 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 stop this where it's at so that we can continue throwing millions of good hard-earned money that we schnard from all kinds of Jews and give it to lawyers in order to continue fighting over who's in charge of 770. So that's how they saw it. Oh, my word, you know. I mean, Hannes um, lives in Cologne, you know, where uh, we had our recent break-in from uh, in our uh, temple trust, you know. I mean, um, and so Mr. Volki is the bishop of Cologne. So he sits on 4 billion euros in cash. But says everybody he's poor because it belongs to the Santa Sede. So now... 2018, when you started here, MN Global, the discussion, we went before uh, through your website, okay? So he basically uh, came out with the pedophilia report, 2018. So in order for him to get rid of the accusation of his involvement, he spent millions, millions and millions of dollar, euros, you know, so that he's not getting caught by the police that nobody's questioning it, you know? So, and this is going on all over the world where religious people, you know, they play with the heart and with the, you know, emotions of their followers. And then they spend millions in futile projects. It doesn't matter, Jews, Christians, liberals, Marxists, very important. Marxists are very, very keen on dragging people to court like we see currently in New York what's happening with Donald Trump, um, where we're saying, okay, so this is, uh, it's it's part of business. You know? 
you know, and it's part of a business, you all see. I don't want to be part of this. I really want to see justice, you know. I we, I changed here my uh, background picture, San Henry judges and advisors. I think we are at a time the world is crying for justice because mm -hmm. they cannot stand to see how officials use and waste millions and billions of dollars and uh, euros for crazy projects while uh, there is no justice. Only for their own benefits. You know, and I think then becomes operational as soon as possible. And, you know, this is a cry of an Effie, you know, of Ephraim for the nations, of an ultra-Orthodox Noahide to all Orthodox Jewish rabbis. Please get your act together, get in touch with Joseph, the leader of the Sanhedrin Initiative, and make the Sanhedrin functional for all the families of Israel. It's of vital importance. We cannot allow anymore that unbelievers, Marxist, radicals, interest groups can judge over us as a holy people. It's, and I think the time is better than ever because currently there is no court who really speaks justice. It's just who has the most money is going into a lawfare. And, you know, when you are thrown dead with money by lawyers, okay, then you have to give up. I mean, we saw this with General Flynn. He he couldn't continue. It cost him millions of dollars to, uh, you know, defend himself in court. And, and then he said, okay, I give up. Okay, I'm guilty. Was he guilty? No, I don't think so. Yeah, but he was pushed into this. All right. And this also, is a system. It's currently one hundred percent, and I agree with you. The the justice system in the world is uh, is out of commission, and that's why the Sanhedrin is necessary. Um, today, I actually spoke to uh, an Arab friend uh, in the in the repair shop, and I told him that the main uh, two of them actually, <clears throat> and. One in the gas station, one in the repair shop. And I told both of them that the most important thing for Arabs today is to separate themselves from the, the atrocities that Hamas is involved in. Because if you cannot separate yourself from those things, um, then you are going to be counted in, in the punishment. I think that all... Um, at least um, uh, if I have to compare the Japanese to the German and in the way they took an attitude after the war, the Germans at least uh, manned up to what they did. There's a lot of education about the Holocaust. It's a, it's a legal offense um, to deny the Holocaust in Germany. Anti-Semitism is, is punishable uh, by law. And uh, the educational system makes sure that uh, people are aware of you know what happened but J japan on the other hand up till today they are not ready to even admit that they were wrong and and not only what they did to in helping uh you know uh in the war but they also what they did in nanking those who know you know what they did to the chinese during uh, world war ii they're still not ready to admit about that and um uh, taking a and that's and and you know Hashem works the you know the way Hashem works. We see that they're having uh, earthquakes and tsunamis, and it's not it's never stopping over there to a point where it's not even news anymore. You know, Japan is you know uh, there's this uh, scam. Uh, you know, Japan is trying to get more people to come back to Japan, and they're basically uh, offering people houses for like a thousand bucks. But they're not even worth, uh, you know, one penny. Um, so the situation there is just in the decline, of course, and so on. But I think that at least um, when you divide yourself from a sin, you are already in a better position. But that's only the first step. Of course, the next step is, of course, in the Geula process to establish the Sanhedrin. And, and on that, I would like to say that this past week we had a conference in Yerushalayim. Rabbi Yudah Hayek, of course, Rabbi Tzvi Idan, Professor Avram Ehrlich, 
and many others, Breslover Hasidim, um, Polisher Hasidim, Litvisher rabbis, Hungarian uh, uh, Hasidic rabbis. We had rabbis from all across the the the, the religious um, spectrum. spectrum. Yes. Yeah, all get together and talk about how important it is to actually put together a Sanhedrin as, first of all, that there should be justice, and second of all, as a tool um, in the arsenal of the religious Jew and the Geula process. So thank you very much all for plugging uh, the Sanhedrin and, and, you know, your message to the Jewish rabbis. And uh, I actually uh, have good news that uh, one of the Chabad rabbis, a big uh, Torah scholar that we've been in touch with, um, is going to write a draft for a Psak Din that the Sanhedrin should uh, put out. So hopefully the next time we get together, uh, we're going to have a Psak Din that we can pass around uh, the judges uh, to see if they can agree on it and pass it in relation to Mashiach. It's a very articulate legal halachic document and uh we hope uh to continue in this work of course as you know uh, we've been covering uh the issues in the war there's a new issue regarding how to deal with the bodies of the soldiers that die in Aza. there's different organizations that are trying to uh you know take body parts and, and uh, you know organ donor operations there's different laws in the torah against violating the dead of course, uh, there's a lot going on and there's a lot to be addressed and we're trying to uh, be on top of all the halachic questions that come that come up, you know, Yes. Thank you so much. we are now 100 days in, uh, 100 days uh, at war and um, so it's um, you know, uh, we had this uh, incident in The Hague where um, Israel was accused of a genocide. I think this is off the table, you know, but uh, what Patrick uh, yesterday pointed out that, you know, after 100 days, if the Hamas wouldn't have been stopped, we would have 120,000 dead Israelis and dead Jews, because this is how much Hamas killed on the first day in a, the most brutal way. So now they're complaining that because, you know, their leadership are cowards and they hide behind uh, their own family members and so on. Apparently, there are 30,000 people were killed by Israelis now during the, um, the strike. So it's in no comparison, no comparison. And uh, so what Hamas did is indeed genocide. And I think, you know, a lot of people they do not understand that it's not because you killed somebody, it's immediately genocide. There is a letter of the law, you know, it's US code title 18 of the penalty code, you know, I think um, paragraph 1092 or so, you know, so there is a definition on what it means. You know, so when you target in specifically one group of people for annihilation, well, then it's genocide. So what the Hamas did, they targeted Jews, they targeted Israelis. Now, when somebody comes up now and says, hey, listen, you know, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Well, this is a call for genocide, my dear friends. This is the more because it targets one group and one specific group. It targets Jews. Okay? Now, when the IDF retaliates. It doesn't retaliate because they are Palestinians or whatnot. No, they are Arabs. No, he, they are targeted striking military targets. Now, when the Hamas over decades now took in billions and instead of developing the economy, building tunnels, and they are flooded now, well, a mild chance. Uh, what's what? How how would how would you say that? Yeah. Is what can what can you expect? And and oh, I want to say that right now, what's happening in Gaza is that the is IDF is founding is finding 
uh, caches with weaponry, you know, huge stockpiles of weapons that, um, you know, if you just think about, like you said, if you think about these weapons being used against Israeli targets, you yes. you will get to a hundred thousand deaths. Now, Yossi, I'm thinking about this since the time I was there. Now the stockpile of rockets grew. You know, at the time when the, the second Intifada started, you know, so there were an estimated 50,000 Katyushas, you know, stored uh, from the Hezbollah. So now it's 250,000. I mean, they heavily uh, put up their game. Incredible. Now, through the tunnel system of Hamas, they are smuggling now for 18 years, since 2005, since Ariel Sharon basically made Gaza Juden rein. You know, it's a, it's a great idea of the left, you know, take the Jews out, 5,000, they deported them out of Gaza, and then Hamas took over. And then since then, they are sucking everything out to build up what we saw on uh, October 7th. You know? All right. Oh, so right now it, the, the military, the military is taking a lot of these um, weapons of the Hamas, especially the crappy ones, and they're putting it in the tunnels, and then they get their, um, they get the special units that know how to detonate the whole thing. Yeah. So they're blowing up the Hamas in their own tunnels <laughs> with their own weapons, yeah. And uh, that's what's happening right now in Gaza now. All of this pain and suffering could be avoided if these people wouldn't be so jealous and hateful of the Jewish people. If they, instead of looking at the Jews, they would look at themselves, look at what they can contribute to society, look at what they can build, look at what they can do. They could have turned uh, Aza into Dubai, and then the leftist liberals would get their way. But there's a reason why Hashem in the Torah says how the Jewish people should conduct themselves in Eretz Yisrael. It's not because Hashem is unjust. It's exactly because Hashem is just. Hashem knows exactly which children deserve which pieces of land, which, which, which actions are fair and just. And, and if we would only follow the Torah, and then we would realize that Hashem doesn't make mistakes. You know, the reason why Yishmael was sent away was because he wanted to kill Yitzchak. And when and when he when Sarah said, why are you shooting at my son? He said, no, 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 I'm just playing. I'm just playing. And this is the same thing we have with the Hamas. They shoot at Israel and then they say, no, no, we just want to cease fire. We just want to cease fire. It's the same thing. So any issue that we have today, we just need to open our eyes and look in the Torah and we have the answer. As long as we take the Torah yeah. seriously, and we know that what Hashem says is applicable to today, we look at the nature of the situation right now, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Israel is a tiny piece of land, this big, you know, on the map, it's a tiny little strip of land. The Arab nations have the whole map. There's no reason, yeah. there's no, no reason why world. everybody should want it. And, um... The Adam, the you know the the empire of the beast, the fourth beast. It's also huge. It's also huge. Yeah. You know, yeah. But it's um, very important um, what you said. It is very important for everybody to read the Torah for themselves, to study for themselves. You know. Um, so we found this out now for for so long. You know. I mean. Um, all the people who studied with us now in Germany, sometimes now for seven years, eight years, nine years, okay? So once you open up the eyes of a, a somebody, you know, to the reality of Jerusalem and how this is connected with the Jewish people and the Bible and what modern politics is all about, you cannot go back to sleep. You cannot go back to sleep. So in the moment you start really reading the Bible and you read the prophets and so on and so on, it's better than reading the news. Because you know the news are fake, but the war around Jerusalem, what's happening, this is real. It's absolutely real. 
but it's a it's a, 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 a war which is fought with deception, with um, misinformation, with the lies, and so on and so on, corruption. But the Torah is the measurement. It is the the book of truth of life of the source of uh, eternal life. And uh, once you know what's written in the Torah, nobody can cheat you out of anything. Represent all. I want to. I, so I want to say that we're going into the month of uh, Shvat. We're now uh, Vav Shvat, and soon we're going to be in Tu Shvat, which is the the Chag Ha'ilanot, tree. the the holiday of the trees. And it's a very big question. And I want to say this in the name of uh, my brother-in-law. Yonatan, which uh, is a great uh, Torah scholar, and uh, he says that it's a very big question. Why Why does Hashem say that we should celebrate Tu Bishvat, the new year of the trees? What's the point of this? And of course, we know that it says, Ki Ha'adam Etz HaSadeh. Ha'adam is the man. Ha'adam Etz HaSadeh, the man is like the tree. Now, Ha'adam is with Heya Yediyah, which is the man goes on all mankind. We have, for example, in the Noah, it says, Yetzar Ha'adam Rami Neurav. The inclination of the man is, is evil from when he is young. This is how Hashem kind of justifies the fact that people sin. Okay? So when we talk about Ki Ha'adam Etzatzadeh, we have to understand what the Torah is telling us. Of course, this is in the Torah. This is not in the Talmud. This is in the Torah. And the Hasidus and the Zohar explain that we know that, and we'll start with the Rambam. With the Rambam says, Ki dea et Hashem kamayim layam echasim. That when Mashiach comes, the world will be covered in the knowledge of Hashem like the water covers the ocean. And we know that en maim el Torah. Water is like a Torah. And like we spoke about a little bit earlier, we mentioned fish. So in this context, what's beautiful about the fish is that when you see a fish in water, you see that he cannot be separated from his source of life. So too, um, we know that the Jewish people are also compared to fish. Yisrael uh, nimshelal dagim in many aspects. But one of the aspects is that they they survive in the Torah. Okay. Now, when Mashiach comes, the entire world will survive in the Torah. But we have to have a question. What about in exile, in the moment right before the Geula? Is there anything in this world on the earth that could compare with the fish in the water? And the answer is, it's the trees. Because when you look at a tree, the tzomeach, the things who grow, they, when you look at the tree, um, you can see that they are connected to their source, okay? And that without their source, they cannot survive. And this is the work of a, of a Jew and all the children of Israel throughout exile. That when someone sees you in the street, he should be able to tell, oh, this is a Jew. This is someone who's connected to Hashem. Now, I, I actually mentioned this to some of my friends and I said, you see, this is important that you should look like uh, someone who represents Hashem. And then they said, yeah, yeah, but I don't have to actually dress like that. I don't have to actually look like that. It's all inside. So I said to them, well, it says that the tree, you can see that he's connected to his source of life. He says, yeah, well, well, uh, we have a prime minister that looks like a prime minister. But if you look at him <laughs> anyway, but so the point is, um, the question is, yeah, what does it mean exactly? You know, point I'm like, Biden, you know, Joe Biden, where there's apparently a president, he looked like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't look like a president, right? So, uh, <laughs> so, but, but the real thing like is, Biden, but hey, that's for a Jew, story. for a Jew, we have to be, uh, but let's, you know, from here's a good way we can go into what we spoke about last time, that Yishmael's angel is saying to Hashem, Yishmael, the, the father of Islam, he had a circumcision, so he's part of your covenant. Can't you give him the part of the Holy Land? So, so Hashem says, yeah, I'll give it to him in the thousands of years when the Jews are in exile. And just like his circumcision is barren, it doesn't mean anything because he doesn't follow up 
and create justice and, and, and do not kill and do not steal. He doesn't implement the laws of the Torah into his life. So too the land will be hollow and barren. And when you see that the land is full of uh, wealth and success, uh, then you will know that my children have returned and that, they, that the, the, the Jewish people, the children of Israel have returned because they not only have the covenant, but they have the covenant in such a way that it's full with the 613 laws and they try so hard to fulfill them every day. So um, we're, we're almost uh, hitting the clock. So let me just mention uh, the parasha a little bit, if that's okay. Yes, I was already mentioned. You have to uh, uh, be back uh, wherever you have to be back in six minutes. Yes. So let's so let's read. I'm gonna uh, start with uh, Perek Shlishi, Parashat Bo uh, today. Yeah. Let's finish it here. All right. Uh, and we should uh, encourage everybody to read for themselves Parashat Bo. If you do not know what to read, I recommend go to Chabad.org, click on the right button, Parasha uh, of the week, and it gives you for every day a reading. For every, and with the commentaries of our friend Rashi. Of course. Of one, one and, uh, for the, but but oh, for the Rebbe teaches us to lead, but I, I'll just say one, one verse, okay? One verse that I have here open in front of me. Okay, so, one verse. Okay, okay. one verse. Okay, but and then says, I will also put one. Okay, so it says, el Moshe, Vayomer, Lechu Ivdu et Hashem, Rak Tsonchem Ukarchem, Yutsog, Gam Tabchem Yelechimachem. So, Paro says to Moses, in other words, he starts to break under the pressure and he says, Go serve your, your God, but leave the, the sheep and the and the animals behind also your children can go so of course he's already he's already suffering this is already the eighth uh plague that pharaoh is suffering and uh the locusts yeah so so paro is already pretty desperate you know so he's saying okay you can go your kids can go your wives can go but leave the leave the sheep and the and the and the and the animals behind so moshe tells him um, you are going to give us permission to go with our sheep and with our animals, and we will go to we will go to serve Hashem. And then Pharaoh says to to uh, to Moses, "Don't you dare ever show your face to me again, right?" And Moshe says, "Yeah, that's exactly how it's going to be because you're going to be chasing me." <laughs> and of course, we know the famous uh, the. Pharaoh running around in pajamas looking for Moses. Anyway, go ahead, all closing statements. And if you would like to put your verse in as well, please. Yes, um, um, I, um, you know, mentioned this beforehand uh, because we had this um, in the parasha, of course, in the first uh, parasha of Exodus 422. Tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. All right, so, and let my son um, go to serve me in the desert. So the modern day Pharaoh today is this, this dude in white, and we talked about this very, and he, you know, last week, and I found this extraordinary. So the Pope encourages Marxists and Christians to fight corruption and uphold the rule of law. In this coordination, I said, okay, it's very important to understand that today we are living in the order, in the legal order built up by that Roman Pontifex Maximus, by Rome. But the children of Israel, and this is now what we learn again, you know, Exodus 19, 6, we are a kingdom of priests. So when, when I'm going out as priest of the order of Melchizedek and so on and so on, nobody should complain about it because everybody from the children of Israel are called to be priests for Hashem. This is what you said, you know, that, um, you know, how are we... You lead Kohanim Kadosh. Yes, you should all be a kingdom of priests we are a holy, and a holy nation. nation. Yes. Exactly, a holy nation. 
So, and this is currently, when you think about this, that currently the Marxists and Christians are asked by Adam to uphold the law. And I said, okay, listen, something is extremely off here because everybody can read the law of Israel is the best law there is. It's a Torah. It's, uh, it's holy. It's spiritual. It's eternal. And the world should uphold this law. And this is what we are fighting for in the Sanhedrin Initiative, of course, with the nation of Ephraim on Torah Club and everything. And this was my last push for the day. My last right, words well, for the day. Thank you so much. And I'm happy that we were able to show that we don't just tell people what to do, but we can also practice. And just because we don't have a lot of time, everybody can follow we have our uh, shiur that we do. We usually spend a lot more time with the uh, Torah portion, but unfortunately, we have a lot of important things to do. Thank you so much, Ulf. It's always a pleasure. I hope. Thank you. We'll Joseph, likewise. See you soon.